Good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. This is my weekly spot where I can go on about issues that have caught my eye, rant about what's got me worked up, and interview guests who can add some more nuance and wisdom to the whole show on things. Always lots to talk about and uh, a packed show coming up uh, today again indeed. Uh, this show being live, or for those of you who are watching it live, I, I love it when you use that comment scroll, guys. Get in there, put your comments in. I see Leanne put one in in advance talking about legalizing hard drugs, because, yeah, I'm going to be talking about addicts again today. Send those comments out there. Send your comments, questions to me, to uh, each other, and uh, to my guests. And perhaps, you know, I, I read them all. I won't necessarily read them all out though but i appreciate them and just keep things civil so today i, I do have uh, for a guest our very own sean polzer actually he's going to come in and talk because we've got this escalating battle between premier daniel smith and the federal environment environment minister everybody's favorite stephen gilbo who's all the way over in china at a climate conference yet still can't resist himself he's attacking alberta's oil field from all the way over there reach out and touch someone and it's getting things pretty heated and furious around here so that's going to be a good conversation because i think it's really setting up what we're going to see for the political climate between alberta and ottawa in this next coming months when uh, premier smith starts her session and ottawa starts their session so quite the interesting times so I'm going to get on with what's got me going today, as usual. I, I went out yesterday. I guess, you know, I do some field trips and so on. I went and checked out a homeless encampment in Calgary. The police had uh, begun dismantling and cleaning up. Now, this was like at least the third time in this location that the police have had to go down there and dismantle the, the encampments that's in the area. It was littered with everything from propane canisters to mattresses and syringes. It was a mess and it has also been a hub of local crime for months. So the site of tent encampments, you know, and addicts in various states of inebriation and population centers, I mean, it's become ubiquitous. Police policies of enablement have failed catastrophically. Let's just face it, they aren't working and the number of street addicts has expanded exponentially in every city in Canada, throughout North America, as far as that goes. Particularly those cities, though, where they provide a uh, safe supply of drugs. So we've got snow is going to start flying out here in a couple of short months. And every Canadian city is going to see a disaster as these addicts are exposed to the elements. I know we prefer not to look at it and we prefer not to talk about it. But unfortunately, burying our heads in the sand, we're just going to let this looming wave of crime and death build up. And it's past time to start ringing the alarm bells on this. See, I go out and about all the time. I, I, I'm on the road and I look around and I mean, these people are in terrible, terrible condition. They're in danger. They're in rough shape and they're not going to fare well when it gets to minus 30. So what do you think is going to happen? You know, when, when people on the streets hit minus 30 weather, well, they're going to become desperate. And that's where the crime aspect will come along. Transit systems, they'll probably become rolling heated drug consumption centers again. Robberies will rise as addicts can no longer apply their trade of theft and bottle picking due to the deep snow and low temperatures. I mean, the fentanyl addiction, it's a crisis like we haven't seen before. That drug is plentiful, it's powerful, and it's incredibly addictive. So the addicts you see, you might have seen on the streets, you know, they're bent over, they're oddly paralyzed while staring at the ground. Well, they've usually taken fentanyl, and the behavior is called nodding. Now, Sometimes they just simply fall and pass out with a pipe in their hands. Other times they stand there strangely like that after smoking their chosen poison. And, and, and the drug can be laced with a, a number of substances. Now, the drug consumption in itself, of course, is dangerous enough. And that's killing thousands of them every year. But when, it becomes far more dangerous once the Canadian winter sets in. I mean, what do you think is going to happen when they nod off and it's minus 30? They're going to lose digits or they're going to die. Death by exposure. I mean, the, the issue isn't a lack of shelter in general. It's a lack of shelter for addicts. I, you know, I, I've been listening to uh, advocates and uh, the usual anti-poverty so, folks. You know, they feel that if they oppose poverty hard enough, it'll go away. I see them talking on social media. And they're saying, we need more affordable housing. That's the problem. Come on. Yes, we do. But that has nothing to do with these addicts, okay? They need more than a house. They need treatment. They need to be taken off the streets. You can't put them in a house. How low will the rent have to go? How low? If we put the rent down to $100 a month, you think those homeless addicts from that encampment will say, oh, okay, I'll move into the house and become a responsible citizen and pay my $100 a month in rent. No. If they've got $100 in their pocket, they're going to buy $100 worth of fentanyl. That's the way it works. This problem is much deeper than just needing affordable housing. You can't put them in shelters, unfortunately, because shelters won't allow them to keep consuming drugs. 
so they can't manage those strung out addicts, you know, because it's unfair as well to the other people stuck in these shelters. So, I mean, citizens and governments, we're both going to need to embrace a reality check on this issue and really fast. If we continue down the road we are on right now, we're going to be seeing horrific number of de deaths and witnessing new levels of misery for addicts and those impacted by them. We need to intervene. And there's the big word that people don't like. But every, civil every civilized nation has legislation allowing for the removal of a person's liberty if it's evident they're going to harm themselves or others if they're left to their own devices. This can be done in cases where people have serious mental health issues. There's no good reason why such an intervention isn't justified when it comes to street addicts. We have more than enough evidence they're going to harm themselves and others if they're left in the condition they're in right now. Put it bluntly, we wouldn't leave a dog in an alley like that, yet we're leaving people there. You listen to the advocates, we can't infringe upon their liberty or their, their uh, dignity. There's no dignity left, guys. They've hit rock bottom. But the next thing that's going to come is they're going to die. And yes, when we intervene... The success of treatment, you know, and things like that, it's low if the addict didn't come in willingly. But the survival rate of the street addicts when left alone is even lower. So we really don't have much to lose in intervening. And cities right now should be seeking out and securing heated spaces somewhere where people can be kept when that need comes, because it's going to come. And, uh, you know, it'll be, yes, a space to warehouse addicts, somewhere to safely take them when we do take them off the trains, when we do take them out of the alleys, when we do take them somewhere, put them on a cot, get some heat on them, get some food into them, and hope we can push them into treatment. But if we keep pretending that this is just a lack of affordable housing, we keep turning our heads and saying this addiction is unmanageable, if we could just give them enough safe supply, they'll be okay. Guess what? You take fentanyl, even if it's government supplied when it's minus 30, you're probably going to friggin' die. There's no safe supply of that. Quit listening to these enabling idiots, and let's get prepared because we're going to have a disaster on our hands if we don't do something with the addicts when it comes to there's so many more of them out there and winter's coming guys winter's coming all right well that's got what's got me wound up today uh let's uh, check in and see what else is happening out in that big bad world with our news editor dave naylor hey dave how's it going yeah i think you're right Corey. i think uh, winter is coming uh, it's driving in today along uh, one of the streets i go all the all the trees were you know mostly turned uh, yellow kind of depressing in a way isn't it yeah, I know. I, I'm not a fan of winter. I never will be. No. Hopefully we get a, uh, an indigenous summer and uh, uh, that we'll, get, we'll stay warm for a while. But uh, hey, I hear uh, your visitor is back. Oh, the, the black hairy fella. Yeah, he was wandering around behind our house last night. Uh, actually, Jane updated that with another video at five in the morning. It looks like another bear walked by that spot. So I'm thinking it might be the pair of cubs that were there earlier, kind of grown up. So I guess my, my battles to try and save my beehives are going to start uh, again pretty soon. Yeah, and you, you, you've got it all electrified and uh, everything's good this year, you think? I hope so. I've really upped the electric fences. i got uh, some spiked boards that are going to be going up, and I'm going to put those Halloween decorations out that are going to dance around and make noise whenever something comes close. So uh, I'm going to defeat those bears this year, darn it. Awesome. Well, I, I wish you luck on that. Uh, uh, busy news. Busy news. And all charges withdrawn against uh, Hazard James. Edmonton, the uh, court uh, today uh, uh, joined a list of all, you know, many other uh, uh, people who were having their COVID charges uh, thrown out, including Pastor uh, Tim Stevens today on the, uh, the Fairview Baptist Church. Uh, they were thrown out. So, uh, uh, you know, all these people battled against the... Uh, uh, the COVID uh, in, uh, COVID restrictions uh, appear to have won uh, won their case. Uh, also, big news this morning with the feud between Alberta Premier Danielle Smith and Environmental uh, Minister Stephen Gilbo. Uh, he's over in China now, uh, uh, talking to them. And uh, you know, instead of uh, you know giving China some advice, he he used it to uh, shred Suncor. And uh, they announced a couple of weeks ago that they were sort of giving up on renewals and uh, and going hard on the, just oil production itself. Uh, so uh, Gilbo says uh, that means uh, you know his his efforts to cap emissions are are, are even more needed. To which Premier Smith today uh, unle unloaded uh, on him uh, quite heavily. So and I understand you got my colleague Sean Holzer coming to uh, to talk about that. It's uh, it's a developing good. Uh, a good national story. 
And uh, our, our NDP friend, Charlie Angus, uh, he took a shot at the Western Standard yesterday, uh, basically saying, uh, you know, we were partly to blame for the, the death of Annette Lewis. Uh, she's the Edmonton woman who uh, died last week because she refused uh, COVID, uh, a COVID vaccine and uh, uh, was denied a transplant because of that. And uh, Charlie thought uh, it worked. So uh, our opinion did earn Nigel Hanford uh, takes a run at him. So that's uh, that's a good call. I'm also doing well this morning, Colin, or this morning, Corey. And I draw your attention. Uh, I know you're a bee guy. Uh, uh, earlier this morning, we printed a story on uh, bee horror in Toronto. Five million bees on the loose uh, after a truck uh, carrying their crates crashed. Uh, so uh, holy cow, you can imagine, uh, uh, imagine what a swarm of five million of them look like, Corey. Yeah, it'd be quite something around. Uh, hopefully they were well-trained. Yeah, and then you told me how many bees you have. Uh, like, that kind of shocked me, to be honest. Yeah, no, there's uh, anywhere from thirty to, to 60,000 in a hive. I figure mine's got about 50,000. At this point of the summer, they really pack up. So as many bees as that was, it was probably only about 100 hives on that, that truck, but that's still a heck, of a, lot of, uh, heck of a lot of bees on the loose to try and uh, recapture. Yeah, and I bet those uh, those bears are salivating at the thought of all that honey right now, uh, Corey. Oh, yeah. They're, they're making right. their plans. They're coming. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, is that uh, everything we've got going right now, Dave? Uh, that's it. Uh, just about to put up a story on why you should all be looking up into the skies tonight. Uh, a rare celestial event. Uh, it's called a blue moon. And uh, the Arthur Green will have uh, that story up for you momentarily. Excellent. Well, as the saying goes, once in a blue moon, it's not that common. All right. Yeah, that's well, pretty rare. Thanks for the update, Steve, and I will uh, catch you in the newsroom after the show. Thanks, Corey. All right, as you can hear, guys, yes, lots on the go out there, lots of news, lots of stories. Nigel Hannaford putting opinion pieces up there. we got Linda Slobodian, lots of fantastic stuff up there. Uh, Jonathan Bradley and the rest. Uh, you know, Make sure to get on there, guys. Read those stories. Check it out. Share them. This is where I nag you. This is how we beat the government censors. We beat the government uh, control of media. It says we're accountable to you. We don't take any subsidies, any tax dollars, but we rely on subscriptions. So get on there, guys. WesternStandard.news slash membership. Check it out. $9.99 a month, $100 a year. Get a subscription to get full access past the paywall, and it supports all these great reporters, columnists, and, of course, myself to be able to come on here and uh, rant at you once a week on this show. So, again, if you subscribed already, thank you very much. If you haven't subscribed yet, get on there, guys. Lend us uh, a hand. I mean, it's an investment in yourself and in keeping that free information going and uh, and uh, keeping independent media independent. So, yeah, uh, you know, some, some of the stuff... Wait, with the, uh, the, the, the addicts uh, building castles, a commenter saying, you know, addicts just uh, do this stuff to themselves. And, and uh, y y it is, you know, it's difficult. I mean, it, in the end, it does come up to the individual. But as I said, we come to a point where an individual can't take care of themselves. You know, when, when, when you see that addict shuffling up and down the street corner, they're skinny, they're, they're covered in sores, their teeth have fallen. It's really that bad. Do you really, you know, they're barely surviving right now. Do you think they're going to make it through the winter? Like we've got to just face the hard reality. We need to intervene. There's no easy answers to this. But I don't want to keep hearing the stories that will be coming this winter of emergency services personnel having to keep extracting, you know, bodies and, and such of, of people who have passed on uh, from exposure, uh, you know, due to being uh, basically on, on the fentanyl and other such drugs uh, while outdoors in this weather. So see what else is going on in the news out there. Uh, yeah, the BC Center for Disease Control. Yes, it's identified BC's first case of a person infected with the BA.2.8.2.86 variant in the Fraser Health region. Who cares? God, I'm sick to death of it. So what? You found another one. It's a cold. It really is. I mean, when are we going to get to this point? But the problem is it does, you know, for most of us, we don't care. We're done with this. We've had it. But uh, the authoritarians out there, those who feel that it's time, I mean, there, there's people who went crazy over the, the, the whole pandemic. There's people who really seem to appear to like being masked. They, they like being locked down. There was actually a bunch of them protesting in Vancouver. They're standing on the street demanding 
that the law step in and force us all to put chin diapers on again whilst in public, which, I mean, there was all of six or seven of these nut cases, but one guy counter protested and look it up online. You know, that, that video, it's, it's quite interested, interesting that the one guy counter protested because he was a, you know, I guess not supportive of mandatory masking and the people with the masks attacked him and tackled him to the ground and smashed him up pretty badly. So basically they're saying mask up for your own protection or we will beat the hell out of you. That's a uh, nice uh, freedom loving type logic. And I'm certain Mr. Paulser is going to find his way in here pretty soon. And we'll have a discussion about uh, uh, Danielle Smith and, and uh, Mr. Gilbo. But uh, in the meantime, we'll talk about a, a few other news items, I guess. Uh, another one that this story keeps uh, uh, coming up. Uh, you know, it never has an end to it, it seems. Uh, the English River First Nation claims uh, it found 93 unmarked graves at the uh, old uh, Boval Indian Residential School near the Saskatchewan village of Boval. And uh, it's saying the graves contain, this is what they say, they believe the graves contain the bodies of 79 children and 14 infants. Now, when's this going to stop? And I notice it's not, I mean, it's made the news but it's certainly not rocking the nation like past revelations and discoveries have because th zero for three right now, zero for three when GPR, ground penetrating radar, has found things like this, when they finally follow up, and it always has to be, it must be followed up with digging. You've got to shovel, you've got to confirm it. Well, three times they tried confirming it and three times they found no bodies. So I'm not going to believe that these 93 uh, spots are necessarily graves. They might be, don't know. But we've got to stop lighting our hair on fire every time the GPR finds something because it's got a pretty terrible record of accuracy. But here we go again. I mean, at least the news has been a little, the news at least has been calm about it. They're talking about areas of interest that appear to be, they're covering their butts a bit in, in some of the outlets reporting on this. But, uh, you know, the activists and everything, of course, are immediately calling it graves, immediately calling it genocide and all the good stuff. And uh, it, it's got to get uh, uh, more realistic on these things. So, I mean, some of these... Uh, statements like schools should become or should come with playgrounds not graveyards yeah i agree so once you find a school that had a graveyard we'll talk about that but in the meantime calm down the rhetoric get a shovel and prove it because the body count so far on this whole thing is zero and uh, i like it that way i you know i don't like the fact that the world's been turned on end over something we haven't found proof of yet but i'm glad that there weren't actually mass murders going on and children surreptitiously buried in these cemeteries uh you know, Kamloops, of course, is another great example. That was the starting one. That was the one that set everything off. And people get mixed up on that a lot. Kamloops was never known as originally being a cemetery. It was an orchard and a septic field. And uh, there's been, to date, even though they kept saying 215 and then 200, to date, the body count in Kamloops is zero. And uh, until somebody actually identifies a body, that's not going to change. All right, so let's talk. We've got in studio Sean Polzer. He's our edit energy and business and everything in general reporter. So uh, thanks for coming in, Sean. Uh, we got some some interesting times happening here between Ottawa and Alberta. Eh? Yeah, thanks, Corey. Uh, yeah, we've, well, there's been kind of a war of words in the Twitter sphere. I don't know what you call it these days, the exosphere uh, between uh, Premier Danielle Smith and Environment Minister Stephen Jubeau, Um Pretty much started uh, when he came to Calgary in July. Um, Followed up with the electricity regulations, and uh, just this week uh, he traveled all the way to China. And instead of criticizing the Chinese for their emissions, which amount to about a third of all the greenhouse gas emitted in the world, uh, he took a shot at Suncor for uh, selling off its renewables business and said it warrants uh, an emission cap. Yeah, and I mean, the announcement that Suncor, you know, an oil company, was going to remain an oil company came out a, about a week or two weeks ago, perhaps. I mean, when they formally, they've been kind of shedding some of those renewables for a little while, but this isn't really big news. Why Why did Joe Bull choose right now to suddenly go on about a, a Suncor? That's a really good question. I think it's just because he's going to come out with uh, the emissions cap. So this is going to be the next shoe to drop. Um Apparently, it was supposed to have been released already, and it's been delayed. So uh, my thought is probably within the next week or so after he gets back from China and before he goes jetting off to Dubai for the uh, COP, uh, I'm not even sure what it is, COP28 summit, um, that uh, these are going to drop, and then he's going to hop on an airplane and get out of town as fast yeah. as he can. Well, the irony of this, this summit happening in Dubai, too, where they don't care. They're pumping the oil out 
with, with mad abandon over there, and they're more than happy if the Canadians are stupid enough to shut in their own resources. I I, I tend to agree. <laughs> I think there's a lot of virtual sig vir, virtue signaling going on with the uh, with the sheiks over there because they they want to pump more oil and be seen to be uh, good corporate citizens, national citizens, or whatever while they're doing it. Yeah, host that summit. There we go. We're, we're good guys. I mean, never mind all that oil we're putting out, which nobody should mind the oil they're putting out. But I mean, isn't it really demonstrates the futility of Canada always having to play the Boy Scout? And, uh, and meanwhile, he's paying lip service to some of the worst offenders on the planet, being China and uh, and some of the uh, Middle Eastern uh, producers. Well, uh, Monsieur Jibou, in his previous uh, press statements, has actually uh, bragged about uh, Canada being the first mover and... Uh, setting an example for all these other countries in the world to, uh, you know, to presumably follow us, even though uh, China, under the Paris Accord, has a 2060 deadline to reach net zero, and India is 2070. And uh, between the two of them, they are half of all the global emissions on, in the world. And we're at 1.6% of the global emissions, I believe. and Something like that. And we're supposed to hit it by 2035. Right. And uh, Suncor is about 2% of that. 1.5%. Yeah. So globally speaking, even though the world's largest oil sands producer, it's, we're talking tenths of a percentage point. But the ep economic impact, I mean, if we, you know, we, they keep talking, we want to transition, we want to get out, we want to lose the oil and gas in, in Canada. I, I mean, it provides a, a massive resource for the federal government. I mean, people seem to forget that. Some of the supporters in Toronto or Montreal might not realize, but a lot of these social programs they're enjoying are due to this oil and gas uh, being generated out here. Well, they've got a rude awakening coming because uh, I think that the policy of the federal government is actually to make oil production so expensive that it just becomes an uneconomic uh, proposition and producers will basically be forced to leave it in the ground. But what that's going to do for anybody who has home heating oil down east, anybody who drives a car and people are still going to have to drive a car even after the EVs take over, uh, you're going to be looking at, I saw one forecast today, uh, 300 bucks a barrel for oil. Uh, yeah, man. If it, if it costs that much to pull up, but the bottom line is the cost of renewables, if we went to that as a sole source of energy, wouldn't be far behind the oil and gas, especially if you got rid of the oil and gas. I mean, we're all going to take a hard, hard hit here. Well, and it's the only way to really encourage, like when they talk about the transition, the only way to encourage the, the transition is not so much to make the renewable energy cheaper, but to make the conventional energy so expensive that the renewable stuff is cheap in comparison. So Premier Smith doesn't sound like she's having any of this, though. I mean, she certainly responded, as we would have expected out of out of uh, Danielle Smith. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I think she's flabbergasted. So uh, she... In uh, discussions, she's referenced uh, her environment with Mr. Rebecca Schultz as the Jibo whisperer. And uh, I think they're coming to the end of their rope and like re really trying to deal with this guy because uh, every time you take, you seem like you take one step forward, it's like four, five, six steps backwards. And uh, I don't know how long they continue like this. Well, I'm you can't reason with Gil Bowl. I mean, maybe people will start realizing this. You don't look him up. The picture of him manically grinning in an orange prison jumpsuit as he's being taken away in handcuffs. Like this man's an extremist. He, he always lines, has yeah. been. We're not talking about a, a you know a, a environmental activist who's been rational over this time. This is a guy on the fringe, and and he's the most powerful environment minister in the country. And what's ironic is that he's threatening to uh, have the RCMP come after politicians like Smith and Moe and have them hauled away in handcuffs and orange jumpsuits, you know, for keeping the lights on in the middle of January. Well, and, you know, speaking as a guy who's written a book on pursuing independence in the West, if they wanted to send the RCMP to start arresting Western politicians, I know it would be great for my book sales, but not very good for the stability of the country as a whole. I mean, this is really is challenging unity and stability within Canada. I mean, yeah, as Scott Moe, I mean, this isn't Saskatchewan where these battles are happening as well. Uh, it's just dangerous politics going on right now. Absolutely. And, you know, um, there's for all the talk of uh, separation that there's been in this country, uh, Quebec nationalism is more cultural based. Western nationalism is more economic based. It seems to me that these climate policies are becoming the catalyst for the breakup of the country, Trudeau is going to 
be the one who presides over the end of this federation, this confederation that we know. Well, and some of it's just the politics. I mean, we can see the liberals are in a bad position right now as far as the polls go. I mean, it could be, we're looking at potentially two years before the next election. Anyways, a whole lot, we know a whole lot can change between now and then. Uh, you know, nobody in the CPC should be popping champagne corks yet. You're in the lead, but that can that can evaporate quickly. And one of the tactics, uh, the old one uh, used by the liberals uh, with the senior Trudeau and his advisor, that old term, screw the West, we'll take the rest. Uh, playing the politics of, of regional division has always been uh, an asset for the liberals, you know, if we, because we, what have they got to lose? They got two seats in Alberta, zero seats in Saskatchewan. If they can make us look like a bunch of jerks, uh, it tends to sell well in Toronto. Well, even Paul Martin, um, I was really, I thought Paul Martin was a good finance minister, but I was really disappointed when he became prime minister because when he was down in the pools, that's exactly what he did was start kicking at the West and managed to somehow salvage the minority government out of it. But um, I don't know. I'm I'm hoping that the Trudeau Liberals are forced so far down that they're not going to be able to come back. But what really concerns me is the damage that they're going to be able to do in two years uh, with this wrecking ball that they have uh, flying around the world, uh, imposing all these policy by fiat. Well, an investment chill. I, I mean, really, as an international investor, or even a domestic one, when you see. Uh, that sort of hostility towards an industry in the country, it's going to be a heck of a lot harder to uh, convince you to open your wallet and invest in a capital project when it looks like we've got a, the powers that be want to shut us down. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't realize that about oil and gas is, uh, number one, how much money it takes just to maintain production, never mind increase it. And uh, the lead times, the the time, the amount of time that it takes, to, you know, to build these oil sands plants, uh, to get this stuff out of the ground and build these markets and build these pipelines and do all these other things that need to be done before you can even sell one barrel of oil. Well, something else, I mean, that really poked the stick in the hornet's nest, and that came from the Alberta side of it. I'm kind of throwing like a curveball. We didn't speak on this, but still, it's been a, it's a part of this issue was the, the, the moratorium or the freeze on, on renewable uh, permits for the next six months in Alberta that the Premier Smith's government imposed. I mean, that certainly infuriated those who feel we're going to fully transition into renewables soon. No matter, you know, how you look at it, that will slow the development of these renewable projects to a degree. Uh, do you think, that, you know, that something's going to be resolved, some better uh, regulations and so on, and, the, and those projects are going to start getting rolling again? Or? Well, right now it's kind of like a wild west. And uh, Texas had this problem uh, when it froze a couple years. So here in Canada, when you have the natural gas wells and it goes down to 40 below, you have these things called freeze-offs. So there's a certain amount of production that gets shut in just from the cold. And in Texas, obviously, they're not ready for it. And they're not prepared. And when their gas went down and they had to rely on uh, the renewables for their grid, it was just havoc. Like uh, people were getting power bills that were like tens of thousands of dollars. Um you know, and there's a very real possibility that if you don't have that backup for all the renewable generation that people want to come online, that it is going to destabilize the grid. Yeah, so I mean, it's not the renewables themselves that are problems. It's a worry about the dependence on the renewables as a source. Right, and especially when they're intermittent. By definition, they're intermittent. And, you know, I compared this with uh, our other colleague, uh, Nigel Hannaford, uh, you know, so OPEC, Saudi Arabia, they drill wells and then shut them in and just leave them there and drill the capacity, right? Well, it's a lot like these windmills that only run 30% of the time. So you're spending all this money to have an asset that really is only 30% efficient and uh, you can't rely on it when it's not there, when you don't have the other stuff to... Yeah. It, and solar is horrific. I mean, we're in the nor northern hemisphere. The, the time of year when we would need it the most uh, as a backup is often cloudy, and we only have about eight hours of daylight. So it's a very, very limited generating source for us. Uh, well, I'm kind of surprised that Alberta is actually one of the prime locations in the country for solar. But there again, until you've got some kind of method of actually storing the energy that is produced so that you can uh, turn it on, when the sun isn't shining at night, when it's dark for 16 hours a day, then it probably isn't a very practical proposition to be relying on it as your main source of electricity. 
Has uh, Suncor responded to this, or are they just kind of keeping their head low and, and letting the, the politicians duke it out on this whole thing? I think they're probably letting the politicians duke it out. Uh, they have enough problems with their own shareholders and investors, which I think is one of the reasons why they made that statement to begin with. And uh, they've got nothing to be gained. <laughs> you know, oil companies tend to kind of try to keep a low profile in these political things. But, you know, there again, it goes back to the investment, because if you uh, scare away all all this investment, uh, you know, that accomplishes more than what Jibo can ever do on his own. Yeah, and he's more than happy to scare it off. He knows that. I mean, he's not stupid. He's crazy, which is... <laughs> crazy, uh, yeah. Uh, crazy, but not stupid. Which is dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> yeah. We're all going to pay a price. Well, what crazy times we're living in, but as I said earlier, I think it's just warming up right now. I mean, Gabo's in China. The Alberta legislature hasn't, uh, you know, hit its new session yet with the premier... You know, newly elected now, she's going to feel a lot more, I think, confident in taking stances now that she's been through an election. Nobody can say she doesn't have a mandate. Uh, and of course, the parliament's going to go back into session too. So I think we're just seeing the first uh, first volleys in this fight right now. Yeah, I think so too. And um, I've been quite impressed with uh, Premier Smith and how she's uh, handled the file. Apparently, the electricity one, she has taken it. It, it is her. And I would imagine that... Uh, Missions cap will be. Uh, she's kept her cards fairly close to her chest, you know, at the same time while keeping all those options open. The Sovereignty Act, uh, constitutional challenges, and, you know, uh, but at the same time being very emphatic and very clear that these are unrealistic, they're unachievable, and they will not be implemented by 2035, and certainly not the way that, uh, you know, the Liberal government thinks that they will. Well, certainly gives you lots to cover and it gives me lots to rant about. I appreciate you coming in to explain kind of what's been going on with this fight that's an unfolding. I mean, from China to Alberta at this point, I mean, we've bypassed Ottawa for the time being. Right. And uh, uh, as I said, it's probably only going to get worse. So we should all be keeping a close eye on this. So uh, thanks for coming in to talk to us today, Sean. And uh, Anytime. Anytime. we'll have thanks. you in again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Corey. Talk to you later, Sean. So it is, uh, again, our energy and, and in business reporter, Sean Polzer. And, yeah, he's always got a finger on that and watching it closely. Same sort of thing. Westernstandard.news, guys, that's where you're going to find those stories. Sean has a lot of them coming up for those and, and on issues in, in business in general. And, and this is just going to – it's only going to get worse, you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just starting. Uh, let's see. I'm just trying to see a comment that – Oh, yeah. Uh, Wildrose commenting, saying, is there any truth to the rumors that cartels are setting up in Edmonton? Yeah, this was interesting. This was something that our Arthur Green in Edmonton uh, uh, broke, actually, last week in, in a story. If you look it up on the Western Standard, yeah, Mexican cartels have been uh, having some operations in Edmonton. That's a long haul, guys. But the bottom line is where there's mass drug consumption, there's money. And where that money is, the drug dealers are going to follow. And that's why... We're seeing some of the, the, the stuff. Yeah, um, Arthur's story was, was very interesting talking to people and breaking that down. And uh, these syndicates, these cartels, they're organized. And that's why we see the shootings going on. That's why you get the shootings in the malls and the shootings in the streets. I mean, it's happening in Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, because, I mean, these are nasty people. These are drug dealers. They're rough. And when one steps on the other one's turf, the drug wars begin. So, you know, that's when the innocent folks also get hit. I mean, with the, the drive-by shootings, things like that. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and suddenly some poor innocent person gets killed. Now, some of the discussion on that, uh, fair enough, for, for the drug enablers say, well, if we just provide enough safe supply, then these cartels won't make any money, right? I mean, it's the same logic that prohibition with, with liquor, you know, the, the mafia was never at its strongest than when liquor uh, consumption was illegal in the United States and in Canada, and they could, of course, illicitly supply it to everybody because everybody wanted to keep drinking. There's some truth to that. But... The issue is that, again, that these addicts aren't on something. They're not like people who like to indulge. There's a, there's a lot of casual drinkers. There's a lot of people who enjoy a few drinks. A lot of people can responsibly enjoy a few drinks. You can't responsibly have a little fentanyl. You can't just socially smoke meth. It doesn't work that way. You become an addict. You become one of those zombies on the streets. And uh, it's not sustainable. Now, again, uh, try to find ways to make it less profitable for the cartels, absolutely. But if we supplied it, if the government supplies it, we're seeing that in Vancouver already. We're getting those reports. The addicts go to the cons 
consumption center. They get their safe supply. They go out and they peddle that because they want to buy the harder, nastier stuff that the street dealers can provide them. You got to remember, you're not dealing with rational people. We're talking about people in the throes of a terrible addiction. And uh, they, they just want it stronger and stronger. That's why, and, and I think, you know, some of the well-meaning people but has never been addicted to something. And uh, that's why we see some of the strongest advocates, like in, in Alberta with Marshall Smith. Uh, he's been through addiction recovery. He's been uh, at rock bottom. Myself, I've talked about my own uh, you know, recovery from alcohol and putting a number of things up my nose for a period of time. Uh, that took a, a, a lot of uh, recovery and, and a program as well for me. Once you've been there, you find out that you realize because addictions aren't sustainable. They aren't. They escalate. Some slower, some faster than others. But eventually you need more and more and more. And you let other important things lapse while you're pursuing your addiction or wasted from your addiction. So you're not going to do your job as well as you used to. Eventually you're going to lose your job. It's going to pressure your relationships. You know, wives, husbands, they get tired of living with an addict. They get tired of living with somebody who's strung out or drunk or messed up all the time. And eventually the addict hits the streets. That's the longer uh, trail to get to. Most of the overdoses actually happen in households, to be fair. That's something, you know, a lot of people forget. We just see the ones on the streets, but there's a lot of addicted people living within households and they're dying too because you can't sustain the addiction. Eventually it eats you alive. You, you watch, the, what, what is there for a safe supply, uh, maintainable supply of meth? You look at a meth addict. Their, their, their teeth get eaten out of their head. They're covered in sores. They get skinny. They get drug-induced psychosis. You can't sustain that. There, there's an addiction enablement center in Toronto. It's really been in the news a lot lately because uh, it turns out part of their mission statement was saying that we're never going to try and tell people to uh, stop taking it. Well, because they want to you know no questions asked. Well, they act and imply as if you can just carry on with that addiction. You can't. It's going to kill you eventually. Or you got to get off of it once you, once you get down that road. And that all just comes back to where I'm at. But the, you remember, again, you see, the ones who are saying we need intervention, the ones that are saying that we need treatment are those of us who've been through it. The ones who were, again, well-meaning, perhaps thinking enablement and extending this sort of thing and safe consumption will lead to a good end are people who have never actually gotten to enjoy the, the, uh, the real feeling of being in withdrawal and having your life start to get out of control because you found yourself dependent on a substance that's not doing you any favors. So we got to stop listening to those clowns. I don't care how well-meaning they are. I don't care how many textbooks they've read and start listening to the people who actually managed to get out of that spiral because they're going to offer much better advice and realistic advice, even if it's advice people don't want to hear. All right, let's talk about information that apparently we're not supposed to hear as well. This is an interesting one that popped up from our federal government and our heritage minister, uh, Pascal Saint-Ange. I know I'm probably ruining the French pronunciation. I don't care. Tired of them shutting down our oil anyway, so I'm going to keep mispronouncing your names until you're nicer to Alberta. Either way, she's our heritage minister, and she's taken it to federal court to block the release of uh, some records at the Federal Information Com Commissioner. So this is the person in charge of giving us our information. Uh, and uh, there was a mandate man letter she got, and it was promised to ensure the commissioner is empowered to order government information to be released. Well, the commissioner is trying to order information to be released and the government is taking the commissioner to court saying, no, we don't want to release it. Guess what the information's about? Firearms legislation. Yeah, so, I mean, this comes back to an individual, I guess, in Ontario who's using the Access to Information Act who wants to see some of the files and documents involving uh, firearms and management. And some of them go back a ways, I guess, the 1970s. They were requested two years ago. Why? Why do we have to fight for the information we own? It's ours. It's our government. We're the citizens. See, this is the lopsided world we're starting to get into, and it's dangerous and it's bad. The government's supposed to answer to us, not the other way around. When it comes to us asking for information, they should. the default should be that we get the information until and unless they can really make a solid case as to why we shouldn't be allowed to see it. I mean, there's some areas, certainly national defense, things like that, some contracts with, with private companies that perhaps it's inappropriate uh, for us to see the information or, or of course, personal or information about those working at the government. But firearm records? No, you don't like the political information getting out. That's our information. We shouldn't take that laying down. They haven't justified that. It's scary to think. Where are you guys going that you would actually go to court to... Uh, uh, 
stop us from getting the information we've asked for. It's, it's distressing. And I hope the judge tells her to uh, stuff it somewhere deep and dark. But the problem is, and that's something that broke recently as well, massive numbers of judges, it turns out that, you know, of course, appointed to their roles uh, by the prime minister, also donated and, and, and to the prime minister and, and bought some one-on-one -on -one time with them at some of those large, you know, uh, high-heeled fundraisers and things such as that. It's kind of a dicey area to get into now, right? I mean, it's a right to support political parties, political candidates when you're up and coming. That's the way the system works. You as an individual can choose who you prefer and who you don't prefer. Um, some of these judges may have been, you know, again, just simple lawyers. They weren't trying to buy a seat on the bench when they donated to Trudeau. But, uh, you know, it certainly looks like they were. Uh, I don't know exactly how to fix that, though. I mean, we can't rule out every uh, aspiring I guess, justice, every lawyer who's moving up through that system, if they've ever donated to one party or another and, and, and then no longer allow them on the bench. I mean, I believe once they're there, they're supposed to really stay out of the politics. But the other end of it is the reality of our system. Judges are going to get appointed, even if it's not a donation thing, that tend to reflect the liberal view, that tend to reflect the liberal government. And they're going to get promoted based on that too. So the ones with ambition are going to rule often in ways that they figure are going to make the liberals happier. So I won't be too surprised to see the, the, the judge on this one say, yeah, sorry, uh, Canadian citizens, you don't deserve access to your own information. You don't deserve access to these government uh, documents that are on issues that, that, that are important to you. I mean, there's other ways uh, that governments, even in the city of Calgary level and every other one, fight the Access to Information Act. When you make information requests, one of their favorites too is to say, well, it's going to require 30,000 pages of documents. And we'll charge you a dollar a page to send it to you. So they try to price you out of it. They, they do all sorts of contortions. It's funny, they all talk transparency, but they don't actually practice it when it gets there. And, and that's where we do have to legislate these things. We have to force somehow. We've we got to get the government in check. They're supposed to serve us, not be our overlords. But boy, we, we certainly allowed them to take on that comfortable authoritarianism over the course of the pandemic, didn't we? That's when we just let them suspend our civil rights for periods of time. And... Uh, now, they've uh, tasted that. They, they don't have a respect for our individual rights. They, they see themselves as ruling over us. Uh, we're seeing interesting court rulings. That, that something Dave mentioned when I had him, uh, Pastor Coates. Yeah, he, he got acquitted. Uh, a number of them now. But these are Alberta judges, you got to remember. But that's fine. They're, they're, they're being, their cases are being tossed out of court. And these are guys that uh, violated the COVID uh, restrictions and, and health restrictions and things at that time. They're saying no. No, the, the, those don't apply any longer. The, the, the case is being thrown out. Now, these guys have been put through the ringer. They've spent who knows how much on their defense. They've been in, a, in an area of legal limbo. I mean, people talk about the process being the punishment. And this is an example of it. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. You might be thrown in jail. You might be bankrupted. It's, it's scary, no matter who you are, even if these guys are willing to stand up to these things. But it's still great to see these being thrown out. Because, as I said... The lunatics who like masking, the authoritarians who like lockdowns, the ones who think we should uh, impose and coerce vaccination upon people. See, I don't have a problem with vaccination. I have a big problem with coercion, though. Ask me to get vaccinated. Don't force me. Don't put me out of work. Stop me from traveling. Stop me from going to school. Ban me from restaurants if I might choose a different medical path than you. These people stood up to it. And in the end, though, it got thrown out. Now, if and when, and unfortunately, it's probably a matter of when, uh, something else comes along, a new variant, a new virus or whatever, and they try the lockdowns again, people are going to be a lot more prepared to stand up to it. When they see, hey, in the long run, the courts are going to throw this out. This didn't stand up to the scrutiny of a true unbiased justice. These rights are being violated. It's, it's not correct, and uh, I will be acquitted. So I think there's going to be a heck of a lot more pushback if the government dares to try and start bringing in some of these legislations again. Again, particularly in Alberta, we've, we've certainly got an outspoken uh, premier here saying, no, it's not happening again. Uh, let's see, I'll run through a couple other things quickly. Speaking of wackadoodles, uh, there was an environmental protester who threw that pink paint on a, a painting, a Tom Thompson painting, a very valuable one, a rare one in the Canadian gallery. What is it with these morons? You know, you think you're really bringing us to your cause. I mean, they're just attention whores. We understand that. They're, they're just, hey, look at me. Hey, look at me. 
Either way, uh, part of the problem is we really need to start punishing these guys severely. Give him 30 days in jail. I mean, he looks like a pencil neck little dork. Let's see how he does in remand for a little while. I suspect he'll never do it again. But as long as we keep slapping their wrists and giving them a hundred dollar fine for Dada to pay off because he probably came from some nice privileged upper class household in the area, it's not going to stop him from wanting to do it again in the future. The only thing that's fortunate, I guess, is there was a glaze on the painting and this idiot's paint came off of it without doing any major damage to it. But this trend with these environmentalists, it's got to stop. They, they've got to start actually having some degree of consequences or penalty for some of these stunts they're doing. Um, Final thing, the News Act has been delayed until 2025. This is C-18. It's blown up in the Liberals' faces. Uh, you know, Meta stopped sharing news links. It didn't affect their traffic. They don't care. They make their money out of cute kitten videos and people putting up their food pictures from when they're out at restaurants. It didn't harm them a bit when they called the Liberals bluff and stopped the news links. It did harm us a little bit at the Western Standard. So I'm going to leave you guys off, though, with one more little plug. You can't find our news stories on Facebook and Meta any longer. Uh, maybe that'll change down the road. But until then, make sure to share our link with other people. Share it on Twitter if you're on there. Uh, let people know how they can subscribe to directly so we can get that news out to you guys. I mean, we weren't 100% dependent upon Meta to, to get out there, but it harms us getting to new people not being able to get the links out there. So it's just one more thing that makes it a little more challenging as an independent outlet. So, I mean, C18 is failing, and, and this thing is going to be repealed eventually. But, you know, who knows if Meta at that point is going to say, ah, you know what, we'll, we'll start allowing links again. I don't know, that could be years. So, you know, I see right now, I mean, all the comments are coming on YouTube because we just can't get that out to Facebook any longer. So uh, share that, guys. Keep those memberships coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, to all of you tuning in today, guys, Thank you very much for tuning in this week. Uh, watch for the pipeline coming up the, later on this evening. And uh, we'll be back again this week at this time. And I'll have a whole bunch of new things to complain about. Here's an update on commodity prices in Lethbridge for today. Cash barley is steady at 350. Feed wheat is unchanged at 365. And corn is down $2 at 365 for metric ton. In the milling wheat markets, December Minneapolis futures are lower 4.5 cents at 781.5 per bushel, with local hard red spring bid for September movement at 915 per bushel. Looking at canola, November futures are down $2.30 at 809.50, with delivered buys for September movement at $18 per bushel. In the pulse markets, nearby red lentil prices are higher a penny at 34 cents per pound, and yellow peas remain at $11 per bushel. And in the cattle markets, October live cattle slipped 60 cents at 180.88 per hundred weight. For more information on pricing or picked up options, give me a call at 403-394-1711. I'm Matt Musicum at Marketplace Commodities. Accurate real-time marketing information and pricing options. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada, and more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. You become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny.